Hello, and welcome back to Ave Imperator Productions. Today, we're going to be continuing our look at radical groups in the 1970s with the Black Liberation Army. So, the Black Liberation Army, or the BLA, as it was commonly referred to, is a very poorly known organization that sprung up around the time of the Weathermen and was actually very misunderstood. The history and the story of it was sort of squashed because nobody really wanted to admit that they even existed until near their demise. and. They didn't have the same sort of legitimization from the press that a group like the Weathermen did. They were almost the complete opposite. While both were underground movements, meaning that they hid their identities, they had safe houses, they performed illegal actions, they were sort of diametrically opposed in their makeup, in their marks for action, and in their leadership and other very important ways. The BLA would actually have a much more significant presence in the development of future uh, underground movements, and the Weathermen and the BLA are sort of grouped together in this period as the first wave of revolutionary actors. The majority of the BLA was actually killed as their primary method of action was attacking police officers on the street and as you might be able to imagine this wasn't the best strategy and it led to a lot of fatalities on both sides because of this they weren't written about a lot there isn't a whole lot of people that are looking at it and a lot of them just aren't around today to talk about what happened and what the real story was so we're going to take a look at them, but first we're going to explore where the BLA came from and actually see a lot of the developments parallel the Weathermen themselves. So, like the Weathermen were a splinter organization off of the SDS, the BLA were a splinter organization off of the original Black Panther Party, which was very active in the 1960s and around 1965, around the time that the Civil Rights Movement was enacted, they began to wane. There had always been certain members of the Black Panther Party, such as Eldridge Cleaver, which we took a beautiful excerpt of one of his thoughts on revolutionary action from the last video, who called for an underground and for actual guerrilla warfare. And as the parties themselves sort of started to dissolve, the resolve for them to become more and more forceful came to the forefront in very specific groups. Overall, the Black Panther Party was not very willing to engage in these actions that the BLA wanted, but enough of them were for this to really get rolling around 1970. So, the Black Panther Party was started on the west coast uh, around Oakland, and it slowly spread across the country, but there was one group in New York City that was always sort of different and on the fringes, and around 1968-69, there was a huge case called the Panther 21 case, which was where 21 Black Panthers were set to be put in jail. This was the split that caused the splinter to break off and to form the BLA itself, because the Panther 21 case revolved around these 21 Black Panthers conspiring to murder police officers, which was something that they had had in mind for quite a long time. Unfortunately, two of the men that were involved in this were undercover, well, I guess fortunately, two of the men involved were undercover cops themselves, and they recorded the whole goings-on, the whole plan, and the whole strategy behind it, and then this was used in a grand jury, which was actually the longest and most expensive court case in the history of New York City, to put a lot of these guys behind bars. And while this was happening, the West Coast decided that this was a really good time to send over some of their men to the East Coast to take control and the New York City Black Panthers did not like this. They saw themselves as very different. They wanted a lot of different things from the leadership in the West, 
and this led to another very important development. Important. So, Huey Newton had just gotten out of jail, he would go on to lead the Black Panther Party, and he really didn't like being in jail. He didn't want to go back, he didn't want his people to go back, so he started to really sort of peace make with a lot of his groups to get them to ratchet down from the violence and the rhetoric. And at the same time, Eldridge Cleaver was fleeing yet another uh, charge, and he decided to run to Cuba, as many of these revolutionaries did. Radicals, whatever you want to call them. Cuba, however, really didn't like him, and they put him on a plane and sent him to Algeria. Algeria had won their independence from France around 1962, and they actually had in their capital, Algiers, all kinds of embassies for radical movements all across the world. The Viet Cong, the North Koreans, the South Africans, the uh, USSR, all of these groups of people had embassies for their guerrilla troops, and this was sort of a way of getting their name out into the international without having to do so on the battlefield itself. Algiers itself became a sort of capital of the radical movements of the world at the time, and Eldridge Cleaver wanted to create his own, even though he didn't really have his own group yet. He toured all over the USSR, China, North Korea was apparently one of his favorites, and he came back and he got his right to set up an embassy for the radical black guerrillas in the United States. So now he just needed for them to exist so that his right to gain this money from these rich communist states could be a little bit more solidified. So he phoned over to the Black Panthers in New York City and Huey Newton was actually trying to ratchet up his own power. The two got into something of a power struggle and Eldridge Cleaver got them to be on a phone line. which was actually pretty impressive for the time. And he denounced Huey Newton and kicked him out of the Black Panthers. Huey Newton denounced Cleaver and kicked him out of the Black Panthers. And everybody kind of fell into one of the two camps. It's important to note, however, that the overwhelming majority of the Black Panthers across the country did not join the BLA. They stayed with Huey Newton. It was really just the New York City Panthers themselves who answered this call to arms from Cleaver. There was one action that really set off this whole thing, and that was when... So, before I explain that, the FBI knew that this was happening in the Black Panther Party, obviously because they had informants in the Black Panther Party itself, and they were engaging in a program called COINTELPRO, which is the counterintelligence program. It was much more basic back then. It consisted of opening letters in the mail, sending fake letters, making phone calls, trying to get people to believe things that weren't true. They had a campaign going on where they were trying to get both the East and West Coast Panthers to think that each other were trying to assassinate the other group. And at one point, it's not really well explained, but one of the uh, East Coast Black Panthers was killed in New York City. There was some kind of dispute between him and another guy. The leader of the FBI, uh, Hoover, would actually come out and say that this killing was 100% because of the COINTELPRO, but it is possible that he was just saying that to get more funding. So, this was a very marked moment for the East Coast Panthers, however. Once someone did die, and they really did believe that there was assassination orders out for them, they went underground. Once they went underground, they looked to Eldridge as their leader, and this was where the Black Liberation Army came from. Their first kill was a West Coast Panther who was in New York City, he was writing for a newspaper. They were very brutal, and this was kind of the mark of their style of action to continue on. They wrapped him up in uh, a cord for uh, blinds and set him on fire. And this was the only kill that they actually did against anyone that wasn't a policeman intentionally. And after that, the 
West Coast Panthers kind of said, you know, we're done. We don't really want to deal with these guys anymore. And they didn't. They completely pulled out and the BLA was now a completely separate organization. After that, they walked up on two cops who were in a police cruiser, shot them both dead. And two days later, two more cops and police cruisers were actually shot dead. The BLA claimed credit for both of these. Unfortunately, the guy who wrote the memo and sent it to the press that said that the BLA had claimed the two murders, two sets of murders, was unscrupulous enough to leave his fingerprints on the memo itself and was caught. He would later say that his number one regret was going after street officers, which when you think about it really doesn't make any sense, um, and that he wished that they would have gone after higher profile targets. But the BLA had a huge problem. Cleaver was supposedly the leader, but he told them that there was to be no leader because the head of a snake can be cut off. So. They all formed these little cells which had to fund themselves, had to plan their own actions, had to go out and get the things that they needed, and Cleaver was just kind of the figurehead more than anything else, probably because he was safe in Algeria for the time being. That would change. Cleaver did actually get a lot of funding for his group from the USSR, North Korea, and China, and places like that, but he spent all of it on himself. He had an extensive library in both Algiers and London. He had his offices in the consulate in Algiers set up with really large walls with lights that would go on to show all the revolutionary movements in the world, and he never really sent any of it back to New York, because why would he? He wasn't their leader. They had no leader. So. This was where a lot of the desperation and the tactics for the BLA came to play as well. So if the BLA didn't receive their funding directly from Cleaver, from whence did it come? The majority of it actually came from their first actions, which were robbing drug dealers. It's kind of interesting, the Black Panther Party was very much against drug dealing in their cities, and because of this sort of mark against drug dealers, the BLA could come out and they could, with clean conscience, attack these people and take their money. There were actually bigger drug dealers that would set up other drug dealers to get hit and they would have all of their information passed on to the BLA. And when the cops first discovered this was going on, they had a lot on their hands. The city, uh, New York City, was not a safe place in 1970 and they decided to go after cases that involved more innocent people, which might have been a mistake, but like I said, the BLA was never given any sort of recognition as an organization the way the Weathermen was until very close to the end of its demise, which is one reason why it's not a group that's all that well known. But they were one of the more successful radical organizations, not because... So, a successful radical organization would need the population on their side. The Weathermen failed at this spectacularly. The BLA never actually even really tried. They did set up some newspapers and some fronts to attempt to get an above ground to supplement their underground, but it was always sort of an afterthought, and it was really what Cleaver was supposed to be doing, but he was always very busy in Algiers, kind of enriching himself, and didn't really ever have a chance to really try and establish any of these organizations that would have been absolutely necessary for the longevity of the BLA. Add to that that once they couldn't really get any more money from um, doing these actions against drug dealers, they decided to start robbing banks. And because they didn't have any leadership, they would often bump into each other on the streets without knowing who was there. There was one bank robbing case where two of the cells actually jumped in on the same bank at about the same time and in the confusion almost hurt each other. And when one cell had a successful action against a bank, they forgot to wear masks and they were on tape the entire time and they decided to flee south to Florida to set up in Miami. They didn't know the area that well, they had stolen cars, and when they did an action against an officer, two of them died out of about six. Another cell went to Atlanta, another cell went to Cincinnati and a couple cities in Ohio, another one went to St. Louis, but they all had roughly the same effect. They were all pushed back and would eventually find themselves back in New York City. 
So I want to compare and contrast the two first wave radical groups, the Weathermen and the BLA, and look at a little bit how they both attempted to fulfill the needs of what a successful radical movement needs to do. This will become a little bit more clear as we go further back and look at actual successful organizations and groups, but I wanted to cover these ones because I wanted to show how this is still sort of an ongoing thing and how a lot of the groups that are running around today are even more watered down than the iterations that they are sort of aping to begin with. So the first thing I want to talk about is their funding. The Weathermen were extremely successful with their funding, and there's actually a lot of speculation around this, why the Weathermen were able to enlist a lot of wealthy donors on their side, whereas the BLA was much less likely, and it sort of breaks down that people, especially the rich elites and the radical lawyers and those sorts of groups that heavily donated to the Weathermen, were much more likely to see a group like the Weathermen, a bunch of rich kids, a bunch of educated people who were planning these bombings, were more legitimate and that the very basic and brutal cop killing tactics of a group like the BLA were less legitimate. Because of this, the Weathermen actually had a lot of money after 1971, after the townhouse and when the FBI finally found a lot of them and started to really put on the pressure, they became even smaller, but their funding didn't. And they went into hiding in their books and their memoirs. They say that they became nomads driving around and doing all this, but they were actually in very nice houses in the southwest of California overlooking the beaches. This was the leadership, by the way. The foot soldiers that were still left were still very poor, and most of them just kind of became jaded and left the group altogether. In 1972, they actually performed one action. It was destroying a toilet in the Pentagon, and this actually earned them the name from the FBI, the Toilet Bombers. They were sort of not taken seriously by the law enforcement themselves, but they still had quite the reputation with the people that they were raising money from. In fact, one of the radical lawyers from Chicago was invited to their safe house in California, and they offered to let them join the Weathermen, and this was because the leadership wanted their children, because they didn't think it was safe anymore for them to scout their bombing targets, and so they thought if they were bringing children along with them and looked sort of like a family, that it would be safer. There is some speculation that because the Weathermen were getting older, that this was actually more that they wanted children themselves, but their doctrine said that they couldn't have any, and they actually got this radical lawyer donor to divorce his wife, and his wife moved in with the Weathermen and brought her four children, which were used to scout bombing targets for several more years after that. And he continued to raise money for these people, so it kind of shows the bizarre mindset that a lot of these funders had. The Weathermen became sort of more of a social club that was underground than anything else, and very slowly began to peter out. The BLA, on the other hand, was very different. They were supposed to be getting funding from these radical nations across the world, but all of this was getting squandered by their so-called leader in Algiers, and they had to rely specifically on lower order actions themselves. Once they figured out how to properly rob banks, they did a lot of this, but that came at a very high cost, and it was one of the reasons why they had to constantly be moving. And the constant moving led to performing actions against police officers on the streets that were not very successful overall and helped to lower their own numbers in and of themselves. So the other kind of important contrast between the Weathermen and the Black Liberation Army is the actions that they decided to perform and how they sort of represented what it was that they were trying to do. These radical groups sort of had very, they had very different ideas on what a radical action was. After all, Eldridge Cleaver was the guy who said that rape was an act of revolutionary vigor, 
And so he kind of had this bizarre notion, it almost seems like the end in and of itself was the killing of police officers without really any thought into why or what it was supposed to do. They saw themselves as being at war, and there was one line where one of them was caught and he told an officer that they were at war with them, and the officer replied, if we were at war, you would have a gaping bullet wound in your chest instead of being in handcuffs. They sort of had a dissonance on this, but they very much seemed to enjoy this idea that they were at war, and it seemed to be a lot of where their recruitment actually came from. For the Weathermen, action was sort of like a press uh, briefing. It was a way for them to get their manifestos out, to get messages across to people. It was a very effective way for them to go out and to let people know what they were thinking and to try and get them on their side, but they didn't really do a good job because people didn't really want the services and the buildings that they used in their lives every day to get blown up. They actually, after the Pentagon bombing, were dismissed overall by the majority of organizations and became something pariahs. They were no longer really seen as a revolutionary movement and began to be seen as simple vandals. It's in stark contrast because even though they became vandals, they had originally been seen as these revolutionary figures that could potentially bring on a new age, and yet the people that were actually going out on the streets and doing the things that the weathermen had no stomach for were seen as a loose affiliation. There was a serious hesitancy to declare that the BLA even existed because they thought that they would be labeled as racist if you said that there was uh, an association between these murders, but this all came tumbling down with what was called the Laurie Foster murders in New York City. There were two cops, they were on the beat, they passed a group of three or four men, and after they passed them, these guys pulled out guns and shot something like 60 shots into them, to the point where these guys didn't even have heads anymore on the sidewalk, it was all just kind of not pleasant to look at. And this blew up in the media, and this was when the police actually decided to go forward with the message, much to the chagrin of the mayor of New York City, who was attempting to run for president in 1972. And he really wanted to quash any rumors that anything like this was happening, because he thought that it would affect his ability to run for the office. So. It was partially this idea that they didn't want to be labeled as racist, it was partially this idea that they didn't want to admit that all of these cops were dying, and it kind of goes back to that old famous line that the revolution will not be televised. The Weathermen were televised because they were sort of a romantic organization over an actual revolutionary one, and the BLA were very much buried because the idea that they were capable of pulling off all of these murders across the country was sort of a frightening thought and was something that nobody really wanted to face up to. So after the Foster Lorry murders, they actually took the guns from the officers and fled. This particular cater which performed this action went to St. Louis and they attacked another cop. Unfortunately for them, there were narcotics officers nearby and they heard the gunshots go off and they went over and found these guys. A gunshot battle ensued and one of the four perpetrators got away, but on the bodies of those who had been shot, the police found the gun of Laurie. And this was when the story really blew up, because cops that had been murdered in New York City could definitely be tied to cops that had been murdered in St. Louis. This was also when all the caters sort of had similar situations and returned to New York City, which they called Babylon. I'm not really sure, it might have had something to do with the mythos of their weird kind of religion, cult, whatever you want to call it, the um, Nation of Islam. They may have referred originally to New York City's Babylon. It could have just been code because they had all of their phones tapped and they knew that people were listening to them, but they returned to the city that they actually knew to sort of hold off. They were going to attempt to do some jailbreaks. They did successfully do one called the Tombs in New York City, got a guy out, but this was their last stand, so to speak. They had been very heavily shaved off, and 
the police were now willing to admit that they existed, there were task forces that were on the case, and the BLA for their first time and for a very short time were all over the news headlines. This came to a head with a huge shootout which occurred in New York City around 1972-1973, and they actually became martyrs for the movement in a way that the weathermen never really could, probably because the only weathermen that ever died, died at the hands of themselves. So the Black Liberation Army didn't have that big of an impact as far as themselves go, but their main impact was influencing the idea that these sorts of actions could be used and could be gotten away with through the use of the underground by the what we will call second wave of the underground in the 1970s. This will be the next groups that we look at, the FALN, the uh, LSA, SLA, Symbionese, Symbionese Liberation Army, and a few others, but it's sort of interesting that the one group that really stands out from all of these is the Weathermen, and they were really sort of paraded around as these big talkers, but in the end they were really little more than a figment that was created to sort of spin a narrative on what radicals were, and to maybe distract from anyone actually doing anything which could have any sort of practical danger. Alright, well, thank you very much for watching, I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to like the video. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe. But until next time, remember, have a Imperator.